One of the most effective forms of birth control is a vasectomy. However, there are multiple questions that men will often have about this procedure before they entrust a doctor with their precious testicular anatomy. Some of these questions might include, what are you actually cutting or snipping? What's the recovery time like? What if I have a change of heart later on down the road and I do decide that I want to create little minion offspring? What are the odds of a successful reversal? Will it affect my testosterone levels? And I've been watching Institute of Human Anatomy videos so I know that males produce 100 to 200 million sperm cells per day. What will happen if all those little guys cannot be released? Well, today we're gonna answer all these questions by showing you what's going on during this procedure with one of the cadavers that we have here in the lab. Plus we'll talk about how effective this procedure really is, compare its cost to other forms of birth control, and talk about the biggest risks. It's going to be a seminal one. So let's jump into this anatomical awesomeness. So let's start by going over the relevant anatomy for a vasectomy by taking a look at this cadaver dissection. And you are looking at the right side of the groin. And the first structure I wanna highlight is the spermatic cord. It's going up towards the abdomen, or if we go downward, it's going to take us down towards the right testis or right testicle. And let me just address those names real quick. Testis is the same thing as testicle. It's just that testis is more commonly used in anatomical and medical discussions, whereas testicle is more of the everyday street term, which I don't really know why I refer to it as a street term, as if testicle has some connection to a thug life or something. But anyway, testes is the plural form of testis. It's not the plural form of testi, because testi is not actually a word. But maybe that's the one that could be used for the street term, but again, I'm digressing here. So back to the spermatic cord. If we took a look at the inside of the spermatic cord, we'd see that it contained blood vessels like veins and arteries for blood supply to and from the testes, also nerves for sensation and controlling muscular tissue. But there's also a really important tube that's going to transport sperm cells away from the testes that I'm going to show you as we pull the right testis out of the scrotum. So you can actually see on one side, we've got this connective tissue still surrounding the actual testis. But if I turn it around, you can see on the other side that we've reflected this tissue out of the way. And now you can see the actual right testis. Now on top of the right testis is another structure here called the epididymis. Now epa means upon and didymis refers to the testis. So a great name for a structure that's sitting on top of the testes. But if we were to go inside the epididymis, we'd see a highly coiled tube. But if you were to straighten this tube out, it would be over 20 feet long. Now, what's going on inside of the epididymis? Well, this is where sperm cells mature. So I sometimes refer to it as swim academy because this is where the sperm cells become motile. And the sperm cells are also stored within the epididymis and there's a lot of space in there because remember, it was 20 feet long. But what happens when the sperm cells are pulled out of storage, or in other words, called upon? Well, during sexual arousal, smooth muscle contractions within the epididymis, or our little swim academy storage facility, will propel the sperm cells into another tube, which you can see right here, called the vas deferens, or the ductus deferens. Either name is appropriate. But this vas deferens that you can see a little bit more closely here, it's going to be very important to our vasectomy story. It's about 18 inches long, and that's because the vas deferens travels through the spermatic cord and then passes through a canal into the abdomen, and then will go inside the pelvic cavity, wrap around the back of the bladder, and enters into the prostate gland that contains the urethra. The urethra continues into the penis, and this is how the sperm cells will eventually leave the body during male climax. But stopping these sperm cells from leaving the body is what we are trying to do with a vasectomy. So where's the most convenient place to create this reproductive blockade? Well, as many of you already know, it is going to be the easiest place to access the vas deferens, and that is through the scrotum. There are two main approaches to a vasectomy. One is referred to as the conventional vasectomy, and that is when they actually make a one centimeter incision into the scrotal tissue. The other is referred to as the no scalpel vasectomy which is kind of self-explanatory, but in this case, they are using a puncturing tool to puncture through the scrotal tissue. Now, a lot of people will think, well, what's the main difference there? You still have to go through my scrotum, and I agree because the end game is still to isolate this tube that we learned called the vas deferens. It's just that the no scalpel approach 
tends to be associated with less pain and fewer complications. Both are pretty effective, but if you had to pick a winner, the no scalpel approach is a little bit better and is becoming the more common type that is performed. But once they isolate the vas deferens, they'll create a loop and will actually remove a little piece of it. And this is what the name of this procedure refers to. Vas refers to vas deferens and ectomy refers to surgical excision because they'll take about one to two centimeters of this tube out. And if I kind of give you an example with this plastic tube here, let's say this tube is the vas deferens. We've isolated it, we've created a loop, and then we're going to snip here, snip there, and so we've removed a few centimeters and now we've got these two blunt ends here. And before putting the two blunt ends back into the scrotal sac, they'll cauterize the insides of these tubes so that not only is there a gap between the two ends of the tube, but now the cauterization fortifies our reproductive blockade to help ensure that no adventurous, lustful sperm cells make it through. But because of the persistent reproductive nature of the sperm cells, the cauterization apparently isn't totally enough to make us feel 100% comfortable. So on top of the cauterization, they will also take some connective tissue that surrounds the testes that you can see right here, and they'll take a piece of this fascial tissue, which is called a fascial interposition, and put it over the end that would go to the outside of the body. They'll tack it down or stitch it down with some absorbable sutures, and then you've cauterized the ends as well as an even more fortified blockade with fascial tissue, making the vasectomy even more effective. And once that has been completed, the person is either stitched or glued up. If they made the incision, they'll use sutures or stitches. If they use the no scalpel approach, usually glue is enough to hold the scrotal tissue together. And overall, this is pretty much an in and out procedure performed with local anesthesia in about 15 to 30 minutes. And now I have to tell you a very interesting fact about sperm cells. Did you know that sperm cells utilize the phosphocreatine energy system? I mean, they burn through a lot of ATP to power their flagella. And so creatine actually does play a role in regenerating ATP in sperm cells, similar to how it does in muscle cells. Even the ova or eggs produced by females utilize the phosphocreatine energy system. So of course, we should supplement with creatine to power our male or female gametes, right? Well, there are plenty of other reasons and benefits to also supplement with creatine. And that's why I want to take a second to say thank you to the sponsor of today's video, Create. These guys created the first creatine monohydrate gummy, and they are made using the highest quality of CreaPure creatine monohydrate, which has been third party tested for quality. Plus they taste great as they come in multiple flavors like blue raspberry or sour green apple. And I love how convenient these gummies are. No need to mix it up with a drink or shake. You can just pop a few of them into your oral cavity and chew them up, which I especially love when I go out of town or when I'm on the go. I no longer have to pack a whole bottle of creatine or transfer powder into a little Ziploc bag. Now I continue to take creatine every single day. And I talk a lot about it with patients and friends and I find very few reasons for people not to be supplementing with creatine because yes, it clearly helps improve exercise performance, but it can also improve cognitive function and even help with sleep deprivation. So if there's a high quality creatine product like Create, I can definitely support that. So if you're interested, go to tricrate.co slash humananatomy and use our code humananatomy to get 30% off. That link will also be in the description below. And now let's get back to vasectomies. Now, obviously there's going to be some level of discomfort after this procedure. So men are often advised to wear supportive underwear for about 24 to 48 hours after the procedure to help minimize this discomfort and can also use medications like Tylenol or ibuprofen and even ice the area three to four times a day. The potential complications of this procedure include infection or hematoma formation, but fortunately the risk of these complications is quite low and most men do just fine after this procedure and can return to light activity within a few days and full activity such as exercise within one to two weeks. But what about resuming other physical activities such as intercourse? Well, they are given very strict coital precautions, or in other words, they are advised to use other methods of contraception for about two to three months after the procedure. And here's why. Yes, we mentioned that the epididymis stores the sperm cells, the majority of sperm cells. However, some sperm cells will reside in the vas deferens and can be stored there for extended periods of time, for up to three months in some cases. So a clinician who did the surgery will often recommend that the patient do a semen analysis eight to 16 weeks post-procedure to analyze if there are any sperm still being released. Now, 80% of men typically have zero sperm cells within this time frame, 
but if there are any, they'll just have to wait a little bit longer using another form of birth control and then continue to do follow-up semen analyses until they can be certain that the tubing has been cleared. And then they can remove the other form of birth control and use the vasectomy as their primary contraceptive method. Now, there was an interesting study that came out that said coital frequency of at least three times per week seemed to lead to a significantly quicker clearing of the residual sperm cells during that eight to 16 week period after the vasectomy. So if one wants to remove the other form of birth control as quickly as possible after a vasectomy, you could think the more coital activity or the more intercourse one has, the faster you can clear out all those residual sperm cells, which I think most guys out there would agree that this is a very reasonable strategy. But what about testosterone? Because men do have a genuine concern if this procedure will affect their testosterone levels. Yes, the testes are the primary source of testosterone, but based on what we've learned today, the vast deference is located outside the actual testis. And the Leydig cells, which are the cells within the testes that produce the testosterone, are completely unaffected by this procedure. So as long as the procedure is done correctly and there are no complications like damage to the blood vessels or nerves, which is extremely rare, the Leydig cells can secrete the testosterone into the bloodstream and that blood can leave through the vessels within the spermatic cord so that testosterone can circulate throughout the rest of the body in order to exert its many effects. And now that we've addressed the testosterone concern, what about the sperm cells that are still being produced? Because remember, males produce about 100 to 200 million sperm cells per day. And some people have asked if sperm cells will start to accumulate and cause the testes to swell or enlarge. And the answer to this is no, not at all. Remember Swim Academy or the epididymis. This was a highly coiled tube up to 20 feet long where the sperm cells matured and were stored. But the epididymis is also equipped for cleanup duty, I guess you could say. As sperm cells age or are not used, they naturally start to degenerate or break down. The lining of the epididymis has specialized cells with these tiny finger-like projections called microvilli, which increase the surface area and help reabsorb those degenerating sperm cells back into the body where they're broken down harmlessly by the immune system. This process actually happens whether you've had a vasectomy or not. And so it's the same for men who just go for longer periods without ejaculating, which means there's technically no need for dramatic excuses about needing to release the sperm or the pressure to avoid some mythical explosion or problem. So I'm sorry if any of you guys have been using that as a negotiating tactic for more frequent extracurricular encounters with your significant other. It's technically not true. But hey, if you are looking for reasons for intercourse, there's plenty of science to back up benefits like improved connection, stress relief, improved sleep, and just plain fun, I guess. But how effective is this procedure? And how does it compare to the cost of other birth control methods? And if you have a change of heart, or in other words, what are the odds of a successful reversal? Well, as far as effectiveness, it's one of the most reliable forms of birth control out there. Over 99% effective once you've cleared that post-procedure semen analysis. We're talking failure rates as low as 0.05 to 0.15% after confirmation, which makes it much more dependable than condoms or even some hormonal methods. Nobody says 100% because there's a tiny chance of what's called recanalization, where the ends of the vas deferens somehow reconnect and let sperm cells sneak through. And if that happens to you, I think that you kind of just have to accept that you were supposed to have more offspring at that point because recanalization is so rare at 0.2% or less. And it's even lower if your surgeon uses cauterization and fascial interposition like we discussed earlier. Now the cost compared to other birth control options is pretty reasonable. In the US, a vasectomy runs about $500 to $3,500 without insurance, depending on where you go. But over a lifetime, that's often cheaper than years of pills, IUDs, or condoms. And unlike many of those other forms of contraception, there's no daily remembering or hormonal side effects. Of course, it's permanent-ish, so it's still recommended that people do it when they are pretty sure they don't wanna have kids or any more kids. That being said, it can be reversed. The surgeon can attempt to reconnect the cut ends of the vas deferens, but success rates vary. Recent studies show pretty good odds though, about 80 to 95% for sperm getting back into the semen. But there's a big caveat, and that is time. If it's been less than three years since the vasectomy, 
pregnancy rates can be up to 75%. But if you wait 10 to 15 years, then they drop to around 25 to 30%. And there are various reasons for this. One is that obviously after 10 to 15 years, this individual is going to be a bit older and the amount of sperm produced as well as the quality of the sperm decreases with age. Also, there have been some studies to indicate that in about 50 to 70% of men post vasectomy, with sperm cells never leaving the testes, antibodies might start to develop against the sperm cells. So if the tubes are reconnected, some of the sperm could be targeted for destruction by those antibodies. So again, this is why it is recommended to treat a vasectomy as permanent because reversals aren't guaranteed. And they're quite a bit pricier, often $5,000 to $15,000 without insurance. However, if reversal isn't an option or is unsuccessful, there's always sperm retrieval, similar to how they retrieve eggs and females, where they stick a needle in there and just pull some of them out. So definitely think this decision through. But if you do change your mind, there's still hope, just not a sure thing.